This episode, from the summer of 1946, covers the sadistic and violent attacks on three innocent women and two brutal and self-serving murders by an ex-IAF officer who had been court-martialed not once, but twice. His actions came from a misplaced assumption that he would use his charm and manipulation to gain wealth and social standing. It led to a number of coincidences that aided the police to apprehend the killer. The morning of Friday the 21st of June, 1946, brought some welcome sunshine to London after what had been weeks of rather dismal summer weather. In the Pembridge Court Hotel in Notting Hill, a maid knocked on the door of room four and announced that she was doing her cleaning rounds. Hearing no reply, she used her master key to let herself in, to be faced with a horrific and macabre scene. A woman lay naked on the bed, her ankles tied, slash marks and bruising all across her chest, and her body brutalised. It was clear the woman was dead. The maid ran to reception to alert the staff to the horrendous discovery. From the register, the woman was identified as Marjorie Gardner, and that she had spent the previous night in the company of a former IAF officer by the name of Neville Heath. The 29-year-old former pilot had already left London for Surrey to see his fiancée, and she was calm and collected when police told her that they were keen to speak to Heath. He was an accomplished liar who had used his charms to travel the world and cover up his violent nature and history of petty crimes, and he had spun a story of Gardner going to her room with some unknown man. This is Finch's Murders and Sadistic Killings of Neville Heath. He was born in the Essex town of Ilford, and he came from a modest background. His father was a barber who made considerable financial sacrifices so that his son could attend a prestigious grammar school in Merton Park in London. They overlooked his many childhood transgressions, including petty crimes, such as shoplifting. This lack of discipline instilled a sense in young Heath that he could get away with anything. At grammar school, it was where he was first exposed to physical punishment as a legitimate means of discipline. A far cry from the lack of censure at home. He charmed his teachers and peers alike, but was bothered by the fact that most of his classmates appeared to be from wealthier backgrounds than he was, and he soon developed an obsession with attaining wealth and status that would stay with him for the rest of his life. It is with this background of petty crimes, as he grew older, he began to show signs of a darker nature. Age 15, he and some friends attended a party where he attempted to assault a girl and was only stopped when her cries for help were heard by the other partygoers. Shocked at the interruption, he tried to explain himself, but was dragged out of the room and kicked out of the party. The girl's father angrily confronted him the next day, threatening to tell the school and the police, but Heath had regained his composure by then. He said he was sorry for what he had done, as it had been a misunderstanding brought on by a few too many beers. He had only intended to tease the girl. Her father somewhat reluctantly agreed not to tell the school or the police. When he failed his final exams, it was the first time that he had not been able to fall back on his charm to get him out of a tough spot. He had no alternative but to take a job at a textile factory in London, but refused to give up on his dreams of climbing the social ladder and the path to money. Observing the city around him, he noticed that a sure way to gain status, no matter your background, was to be in uniform. He set himself the goal of joining the military. 
but he would not simply enlist in the army as a lowly private, or in the navy, where he would be forced to spend long months away at sea. He decided he would enlist in the Royal Air Force. As far as he was concerned, being a pilot would be a perfect answer to his aspirations. Air travel was at an early stage in the 1930s, and the new RAF was considered the preserve of daring young men, so he was sure that he would be respected. But the best part for Heath was that he would not actually have to do much work after he completed his training. With the Second World War not on the horizon, he could qualify as a pilot and would be able to spend most of his time frequenting the parties that people in uniform frequently got invited to. He joined up in 1935 and was fully qualified the following year, but had to lie about his background to keep up with his new friends, who relied on inherited wealth to fund their regular elite dinners and trips to the pub. Heath modified his accent and competently said that he had been to Eton and Oxford, but was soon reduced to stealing to keep up appearances. Feeling there was a legal net closing in on him, he fled from his base in 1937 to hide with his family, who by now had moved to Wimbledon. He was quickly court-martialed and dismissed from the RAF that September. He briefly moved to Nottingham, where he impersonated a lord and continued to live with money he did not have. He was caught when he tried to buy an expensive car, but turned on the charm and convinced the court that he was merely a silly young man who had got in over his head. Getting off lightly, he returned to London, but by the summer of 1938, he soon found himself in trouble again when the police tracked some stolen jewellery to a pawnbroker and the broker pointed to Heath. In July, he was sentenced to three years in prison. By the time he was released, the Second World War had started, and he saw his chance to get back into the RAF. His prior history and criminal record ensured he was swiftly rejected. After this setback, he enlisted in the army and was posted to the Middle East, where he was disappointed at the lack of action but more than happy to join his peers in their extracurricular activities in the brothels and bars near their base. He was astounded at the sexual services available in the brothels and developed a taste for sadism. So keen was he that he invented a story about a series of operations he needed to have so that he could spend more time away from his army duties. This raised the suspicions of his superiors, who investigated and found not only had he been lying, but that he had been using a second paybook to fund his activities, and as a consequence received his second court martial, and was put on a ship bound for England to answer for his crimes. The ship was following the long route back to Europe, and stopped in Durban in South Africa. Never one to miss an opportunity, Heath escaped from the ship and hid in a hotel until it had left harbour. Unknown in South Africa, he could be whoever he wanted to be, and he assumed the alias of James Cadogan Armstrong, pretending to be a South African-born, English-raised aristocrat. At the end of 1941, he signed up for the South African Air Force. His confidence put any suspicions about his background out of sight, and he met Elizabeth Rivers, a 22-year-old from a wealthy family. With her beauty and her family's wealth, she was perfect for Heath, who used all his charm and charisma to win her over. The couple were wed within a year, and soon afterwards had a baby boy. He was now back to attending elite parties, due to his marriage. But his true identity was soon discovered. He managed to convince the authorities 
that he was a changed man, and that, since he had not committed any crimes during his time there, he should be allowed to remain in the country. He had still not given up on returning to the RAF, and was pleasantly surprised when a hopeful application he made under his old alias was accepted. After travelling back to Britain without his wife and son, he won respect for his actions during battle, but his heavy drinking was quickly starting to erode his charming facade, and he found himself dismissed for a second time. He headed back to South Africa, where he found his wife had filed for divorce, claiming abandonment. By the end of 1945, the divorce had been settled, and he was deported from South Africa due to mounting charges of fraud and theft. On arrival back in England, he moved back in with his parents. In February 1946, a young woman named Pauline Breeze woke up in the Strand Palace Hotel in London to find herself bound and gagged, with a naked heath standing over her. She had met him the night before, and been instantly seduced by the handsome former pilot, who gave no impression that he was capable of inflicting such a vicious assault. She managed to scream for help before Heath knocked her unconscious. The screams alerted the hotel staff, who burst in and apprehended the attacker. Heath was arrested, but Breeze did not push charges against him, because of the publicity she had, and he was released by the police. On Sunday the 16th of June 1946, Heath took a room at the Pembridge Court Hotel in Notting Hill Gate in London. He used his real name, but added the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He was accompanied by a woman, Yvonne Simmons, who he said was his wife. In fact, they had only just met. Heath had promised to marry Simmons, so she spent the night with him and returned home the next day. On Thursday the 20th, Heath had spent the evening with 32-year-old Marjorie Gardner, a trained artist. Separated from her alcoholic husband, she had a young daughter, but was living alone in Earl's Court. Heath and Gardner had been dancing together at the Panama Club in Kensington. The following day, a maid at the Pembridge Court Hotel entered Heath's room and made the gruesome discovery. Gardner's body was found naked on the bed, but covered to the neck with sheets. Her ankles were tied together, and marks showed that her wrists had been as well, but the restraints had been removed. There were 17 lash marks on her body, which showed the distinctive diamond pattern of a woven leather riding crop, and her body had been brutalised. The riding crop was not found at the scene. A few days later, forensic pathologist Keith Simpson told police, Find that whip, and you found your man. Simpson estimated Gardner's time of death as between midnight and the early hours of the morning. Police learned that Heath and Gardner had arrived at the hotel around midnight, and that nothing had been heard until a door slammed at 1.30am. The cause of death was suffocation, but only after the other injuries had been inflicted. Early in the morning, Heath had left the hotel and caught a train to Worthing in Sussex to meet his fiancée. Ten years his junior, Yvonne Simmons had met him at a dance in Chelsea only a week previously, and knew him only as Jimmy Heath. The Gardner murder was front-page news the following day, on Saturday the 22nd of June. Knowing that he would be a suspect, he prepared Simmons for his inevitable questioning by telling her that he had been at the same hotel that the murder had taken place in. The police let it be known that they wanted to speak to him, and he agreed to offer any help he could, writing to the lead detective on the case with a story about how he had spent the evening with Miss Gardner and given her the keys to his hotel room 
as she retired for the night with a man named Jack. After writing the letter, Heath travelled to Bournemouth, booking a room in the Tollard Royal Hotel under the name of Rupert Brooke. It was in Bournemouth that on Wednesday the 3rd of July he met Doreen Marshall, a 21-year-old woman who had come to the seaside town to recover from flu. Won over by Heath's charms, he told her he was the group captain. She agreed to have tea with him that afternoon and later joined him for dinner at his hotel. After dinner, Heath took Marshall to the hotel lounge to listen to dance music on the wireless. By now, Marshall was clearly uncomfortable with Heath and asked another guest to call a taxi for her, claiming she was tired. Heath cancelled the taxi and offered to walk her home. On leaving the hotel, Heath told the porter that he would be half an hour. Marshall corrected him. He will only be a quarter of an hour. This was the last time she was seen alive. On Friday the 5th, the manager of the Norfolk Hotel became concerned after he realised Marshall had not been seen since she went for dinner two nights previously. He contacted the manager of the Tollard Royal, where he knew she had dined that night, who in turn got in touch with Heath to ask whether she had been his guest for dinner. Heath denied that it was Marshall he had dined with, but agreed to go to the police station to look at pictures of the missing girl and clear matters up. On Saturday evening, he walked into the police station and introduced himself as Rupert Brooke. From a photograph, Heath identified Marshall as the woman he had been with, but claimed he had left her in the gardens in central Bournemouth. While there, an officer was struck by how much Mr. Brooke looked like Neville Heath, the man whose image had been circulated by Scotland Yard in connection with the Gardner murder. Heath asked if he could have his jacket brought to the station, and an officer was sent to fetch it from the hotel. Searching the pockets of the jacket, the officer found a cloakroom ticket and had a hunch. He took the ticket to Bournemouth train station and showed it to the cloakroom attendant, who retrieved a suitcase that contained clothing labelled with the name Heath and a few items stained with blood. Just before 10pm, Neville Heath admitted his real identity and he was quickly brought back to London to be charged with the murder of Marjorie Gardner. The Bournemouth police came to the grim realisation that Doreen Marshall had likely suffered a similar fate to Gardner. Marshall's whereabouts remained a mystery until the following day, when waitress Kathleen Evans, out walking her dog, noticed a swarm of flies by a hedge near the beach. Further investigation revealed Marshall's naked body, badly mutilated. Wounds found on her hands suggested she had grasped defensively a knife. She had received blows to her head, her wrists and ankles had been tied, severely beaten and her throat had been slashed. She also had a large gash that ran from the inside of her thigh up to her mutilated breasts. Some of her possessions were found at nearby beach huts. Heath's trial began at the Old Bailey on the 24th of September 1946. He originally told his counsel, J.D. Caswell K.C., to plead guilty, but when Caswell questioned this, he changed it to not guilty. Caswell chose not to call Heath to give evidence and relied on the defence of insanity. Two prison doctors testified that although Heath was a psychopath and a sexual sadist, he was not insane. He was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging by Mr Justice Morris. Heath was executed by renowned executioner Albert Pierpoint on the 16th of October 1946 at Pentonville Prison. A few minutes prior to his execution, as was the custom, 
he was offered a glass of whisky by the prison governor. Heath replied, While you're about it, sir, you might make that a double. <laughs> 